Hello and welcome. My name is Zach Zetterberg. I'm the curator of art here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And I'm here with you tonight to introduce the Lemelson Center's Head of Exhibitions and Interpretation, Monica Smith. The Jerome and Dorothy Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention has led the study of invention and innovation at the Smithsonian since 1995. The Lemelson Center utilizes the Smithsonian's vast collections of artifacts and archival materials to advance scholarship on the history of invention and share stories about inventors and nurture creativity. And Monica has been a part of the Lemelson Center's team since 1996. And her work there started with uh, the topic that we are discussing tonight, the, the electric guitar. Um, tonight's program, Electrified, Amplified, and Deified, the invention of the electric guitar in America is in conjunction with our current exhibition, Guitar, the Instrument that Rocked the World. Um, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Monica, and then she will uh, share her presentation and more about herself. But um, she studied history at Pomona College, where she earned a BA in history. Her initial focus was uh, colonial and revolutionary American history. And her work with the Wimbledon Center has inspired numerous exhibitions on the power of invention, including projects such as Invention at Play and Places of Invention. And as a Smithsonian affiliate and a place with a rich inventive history, Peoria is proudly designated on the Smithsonian's Places of Invention map. Uh, due to her work on the invention of the guitar, she is now known as the Stratocaster Woman. Uh, we are very grateful to have Monica with us tonight uh, from the world's largest museum, the Smithsonian Institution. And we're also thankful for all of our members, all of our members of the Visionary Society that uh, make programs like this possible. Um, so for tonight's program, if you have any questions, please just put them, uh, type them in the chat box below or the Q&A box. And um, I think we should get started. So with that said, let's, let's learn about the history and the evolution of the electric guitar from the Stratocaster woman herself, <laughs> Monica Smith. Welcome, Monica. Great. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Zach. And welcome, everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to get a chance to work with a Smithsonian affiliate museum like Peoria Riverfront again, uh, and to kind of go back to one of my favorite projects, which I worked on first uh, in 1996. Believe it or not, there was an exhibition at the American History Museum and Smithsonian. Um, and I have since become sort of the go-to guitar girl, I guess you'd say, <laughs> at, at the National Museum of American History. Um, and it's a topic I love talking about. Um, especially in these difficult times, I think uh, music is so important to all of us. And so I was thinking about how, in fact, although in some ways you could say this is a kind of mundane topic, given all that's going on in the world, um, it was making me think about how much music is a part of how we deal often with stressful times as well as wonderful times and how many memories are associated with it. Absolutely. So I hope that in my talk, uh, you will have some fond memories yourself of concerts you've been to or records you heard or maybe the first time you heard someone play the electric guitar, or maybe you play yourself. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the early history just before the electric guitar to give some context. And then I'll talk about the, especially the early days of the invention of electric guitar. And I hope as I talk, uh, you'll feel free to think of questions as, as Zach said, you can put on the chat um, and I will do my best to answer them. And I look forward to chatting with Zach too more about this topic. So I'm gonna give a PowerPoint presentation I promise you, I do not read from slides. These are what PowerPoint is meant to be. They are illustrative of what I'm talking about. So <laughs> we're going to launch right in. Uh, and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy this. And um, I will try to keep it to 30, 35 minutes. We really have some good time to chat. All right. So yes, the electrified, amplified, and deified. That is truly the name of the story of the electric guitar in America. And as Zach said, I was nicknamed Stratocaster Woman. Uh, I also go by Mona Caster if you prefer the short version. So you can call me that if you'd like in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here is just sort of an illustration to give you a very quick sense of some of the evolution of the guitar. And I'm going to go into more detail about all these um, 
constituents you see here and more. Um, but as I said, I think you really have to give a little context to the before times, right? Before we had electric guitars. And with invention, the big question really always is why? I mean, if you think about it, the electric, I'm oh, sorry, the guitar, the Spanish style guitar that we know and love and that you see there uh, on the picture um, has been around in various forms in all cultures across the world for millennia, right? This idea of having the body of something, it can be, uh, it can be something, uh, you know, a, from a tree, it can be from other uh, plant life, it can be other animals, I mean, it can be lots of things. You put some strings on it, you have a hollow body, you get a nice sound. Um, of course, different cultures use different materials available to them. Um, and so this guitar has been around for a very long time. Now, it, particularly in Europe, gained uh, popularity in, in about the 16th century, um, and obviously came to America um, but I'm going to start here with Christian Friedrich Martin shown here because he's really known as sort of the father of the modern American uh, guitar in, in, in terms of the acoustic version. And one of the things is he's actually an immigrant from Germany, as many inventors are immigrants. Um, and you've probably heard of the Martin Guitar Company. Uh, he really brought on this important um, invention of cross bracing. And that's why I show you this picture in the middle so you know what I'm talking about. The idea of this was to strengthen the body of the guitar um, because as you can imagine, they're pretty flimsy. <clears throat> and especially as you add metal strings, <clears throat> they become, uh, it can be really hard on the body of the guitar. And so he figured out this way to um, increase <clears throat> the uh, strength and that helped uh, the guitar in the American form really grow over the years. <clears throat> Another important inventor was Orville Gibson. And again, you've probably heard of the Gibson Guitar Company. Um, and what's important here is that he developed a new sort of style of American guitar with this rounded body. Um, and this rounded body is really called an arched or carved top guitar, which was both stronger and louder even than the flat top design that you've seen. Um, and one thing you should notice here is again, though the headstock is kind of similar, you've got the, the sort of squared off um, headstock with the six um, tuners um, and, you know, it otherwise looks a lot like the previous one. It's just that the rounded body is going to give it a slightly different sound, but it still has this very symmetrical look to it, <clears throat> which is important in acoustic guitars because the way the sound reverberates, reverberates in the body, you have to have a symmetrical shape. And then you have a sound hole or multiple holes. In this case, you have a sound hole in the center. Or, uh, Monica, do you mind if I ask a question real sure. quick? Are Monica, are, uh, is Martin and Gibson, are they in New York during this time or where, do you know where they're? Where they're uh, Martin is still was in and still is in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Um, Gibson, I think, I can't remember where he started. Uh, they did go to Michigan and that is where the company is okay. now, uh, but I'm not exactly sure where he started. That's actually a good question that I probably knew at one point 25 years ago. Sure. <laughs> um, so here we have uh, Gene Autry and his Martin D45 D for Dreadnought. Now it's hard to tell in this picture, but that is a very big guitar. Um, and really the reason I bring this up next is that, you know, coming back to my question, why the electric guitar? Well, music um, uh, sort of halls were getting bigger at this time. There were larger audiences, there's a larger middle class now in the early 1900s that can afford to go to um, hear music. Um, and so the, as you get into larger and larger halls, it gets harder and harder to hear an acoustic instrument like the guitar. And so there's a lot of players and makers who are trying to figure out how can I get my instrument heard? And so you saw the, some early ideas about the cross bracing and the curved top to help bring out some sound. But now we're talking about really big guitars in part because you're now using steel strings and steel strings um, need a lot of, uh, have a lot of pressure on them, right? So you kind of need a sturdy instrument. Um, but this became a very popular um, instrument in the 1930s and was widely imitated by others. Then you get these great guys, the Dopiero brothers. And unfortunately, I don't know which one is John, uh, but around 1925, he borrowed an idea from the banjo. And you can see in this picture how that works. Um, it's using banjo type metal resonator cones in the body of the guitar. So this is sort of a, it's a hybrid instrument in many respects, right? It's sort of a banjo guitar. Yeah. Um, 
And the power of that is that with this metal resonator, you get a really loud sound. Okay, so now you're really gonna be able to hear this thing uh, when it's in a large band in a large hall. Um, this sound had a very, as you can imagine with the metal, very loud, very brash sound. Um, some people loved it, some people hated it, but it certainly took off among Hawaiian music, which was big in this early period, um, and also in uh, blues music, which you can you know, appreciate how that sound coming from the South, moving to the North in this period, um, this instrument would have been great for that. The other big issue now is that you're getting more dance, big band dance music and dancing as, as an outing for, you know, as a social outing. Um, I use this picture, you could use a lot, but um, I'm from San Diego originally, so I found this picture uh, from 1941, and I point out the guitarist back there. You can imagine with, in a loud hall like this, with a large band with horns, it would be very hard to hear the guitar. They would basically use a sort of a background rhythm instrument. Um, so now, you know, these groups like Duke Ellington and Betty Goodman and Glenn Miller, uh, they often did have... Um, uh, a guitarist, but again, it was really used as a, as a rhythm instrument. <clears throat> now, another issue for sound was about recording. And a really important part of this story is what else is happening in the invention world. And this is the rise of the microphone. Um, so you can see on the left, they used to use these horns. And look at how these poor guys all have to like jam themselves <laughs> up close to the thing to be heard. Um, you can imagine that did not make for a great, uh, experience for anybody, not for the sound recording, not for the musicians, not for the conductor. Um, but in the 20s, the um, electrical microphone uh, really becomes an important um, invention. And this leads in part to why the rise of radio in this period of time, um, and really the beginning of what we know as sort of um, public broadcasting, right? Oh. So you're getting a lot of uh, now radio performances and with this great microphone, now you can see that the orchestra can actually play in a normal fashion. Um, they're not having to work quite so hard, but it was still really hard to hear the guitar in all of this. So people realized that what they need to do is add an electrical signal, right? So as electricity, mind you, electricity was only coming into rural areas in the United States in the 20s as well. Mm -hmm. So electricity for a lot of people is still a pretty new idea. Um, but they realized very quickly that if you could amplify the sound using electricity, uh, that that might be a way to have that louder guitar, that louder sound that everybody wanted, that you could now hear better in this recording. So uh, I use this illustration because it's, I always get messed up when I try to explain how a pickup works. And it seems like this is better than me trying it. So this is one of the few slides in which you might actually want to read it uh, to see how they work. <laughs> yeah. um, I would just point out, this is not a particular historic moment to this, but Pickups still are often hand wound. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Rickenbacker factory in California um, and see just all these, and mostly women, um, wrapping these pickups. And one of the reasons women are often uh, hired to do this is because they have smaller hands generally than men, and so they can get a tighter wind on the pickup. So anyway, people start experimenting with this. Sorry, Zach, go ahead. No, you're fine. Do you know uh, where the... The, the pickup was invented. That was something so, I was thinking about earlier. And I looked it up a little bit. I could, didn't really get a clear answer. It seems like there's a lot of uh, inventors who dabbled in it. But uh, yeah, that's ex uh, thank you. You're, you're underscoring a very important point. Yes, there were a lot of people playing with this idea. Um, it is very hard an invention. If anybody tells you, oh, that person was definitely the inventor, uh -huh. always take that with a little grain of salt because there were a lot of people who had the same idea. And it's because, as I said, with electricity becoming more common, yeah. um, there's a lot of people that have this idea, right? It's, it's not that big a next step to think, what do we do with this thing, right? How do we make these things louder? How do we make other stuff louder? But the person that I think um, really brings the electric guitar in a meaningful way um, and generally gets sort of more of the credit um, was not actually Adolf Rickenbacker, whose company it was, but George Beecham, who worked with Rickenbacker at the Rickenbacker mm -hmm. company and invented this horseshoe pickup that you can see in the picture. I don't know if you can see my uh, circling where that yeah. is. Um, so let me just talk briefly about that. Um, well, first of all, the Rickenbacker company was founded by Adolf Rickenbacker, shown here holding the prototype. Um, which looks like a little mini frying pan, thus the nickname. Um, he was actually a distant cousin of World War I, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, in case uh, any of you are a uh, history buff. 
And um, George Beecham in 1931 produced this electromagnetic pickup um, in which the current passed through a coil of wire, like you saw in another picture, was wrapped around a magnet and creating this field. This one was tried out, as I said, on this scrap of wood guitar, which until our exhibition in 1996 had never left the Rickenbacker headquarters. Um, wow. I actually got to personally go pick it up and carry it home to DC uh, and put it in the case. Oh, that's great. So it, it's the very first, um, essentially, electric guitar. Um, and so it was introduced on the market shortly thereafter. Um, this is a 1934 brochure, but it actually came out in early 1932. Um, and at the same time, Beecham had applied for a patent for his frying pan um, guitar and then had a second patent go in. And I love this, uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, the midgets of the world uh, attained gigantic steps. Whoops, I went, let me go up, there we go. Uh, Touched with the magic wand of electrical genius, the quality it lacked has been conferred upon it, volume. Uh, <laughs> I think that really says it all. Yeah. Um, this was a really big deal, but this is a great story of when invention and patenting can go very wrong. Um, so uh, <clears throat> he had had this patent and, and, and as you can see, there was an actual instrument that had already been produced. People could plug it in, you could play it. But when they sent in the guitar patent, uh, several examiners said they weren't sure that this was an operative, an operative instrument, even though they had clearly played it and shown it. So Rickenbacker actually sent this guy, Saul Hoopy, to the patent office in Washington, DC to play it for them to show them that this thing really worked. And uh -huh. again, here you can see the patent. It looks very much like that instrument you just saw before, right, with uh -huh. the horseshoe pickup. And here's all the detail. You can look it up. One of the great things is all patents are public. Um, you can just put in the number, or you can put in the name, see what else each of them uh, invented. Um, but you can find lots of information on the US Patent and Trademark Office site for free. Um, so we do have one of these frying pan guitars. In the oh, do you? in the exhibit yeah great yes i thought you did i thought i'd seen in a picture do you know um, how many of those were made not many um okay. i don't yeah. recall the exact number but i think it was in the low hundreds okay uh, not not thousands um but I, I have to read this to you because i just think this is great about the patent office because we get a lot of questions at the lummelson center about invention does invention equal patent we strongly believe no it doesn't i mean inventions can be patented but they often aren't um, for a variety of reasons. Um, patenting, among other things, can be very expensive and difficult and time consuming. Um, and in fact, as Beecham discovered, by the time he got his patent, it was too late and everyone else had already done the same thing essentially. And so he lost out on it. But I, I just want to read this to you to show you what this guy went through. He said, <clears throat> you will recall that we demonstrated the instrument to the examiner handling the case. The examiner, instead of acting favorably on the claimant's claim that he'd agreed to allow, transferred the application to another division. I know this examiner questions the operativeness of the instrument. In the meantime, my client has marketed a great many of these instruments and professional museum, musicians have adopted it. It is of course absurd for the examiner to reject the application on the ground that the device is inoperative when we know that it is highly successful and far superior to anything that has ever been marketed. So <laughs> that was from Beecham's patent attorney. Um, so as you can see, he got the patent, but by the time he'd gotten it, other inventors had developed their own and had uh, made electric guitars of their own. <clears throat> Now, what I, love, things, I love yeah, the patent drawings almost yes. as much as the story. I mean, whoever was uh, hired to do these is. Uh... Yeah, pa um, patents are really an art. And um, I, I do highly recommend if you have any interest remotely in this uh, to go look through some famous patents because all of these numbers have, uh, you know, narratives associated with them describing all the different aspects of what they're trying to patent hmm. um, and how it works. But the art is beautiful um, a lot of times for these, these things. And uh, it can be fun. I mean, you can look up anything. If you look on any kind of appliance and you see a patent number, you can go look it up um, and see how what they what they patented on it. Um, so, because it's usually parts, it's usually not the whole thing. It's usually there's some part of it that has been patented. So, as you saw with Soul Hoopy, and now you're seeing with Noel Boggs, this kind of guitar was not what we call the Spanish style guitar that you had seen earlier that you would play upright. Um, this Hawaiian or lap steel guitar was played, as you can see, on your lap uh, or on a stand that was um, horizontal, and you could sort of slide this um, bar across it. So you got this sound that people really liked for um, a lot of Hawaiian and country music 
uh, it, it was pretty easy to play. Um, and so this sort of was the first way that the electric guitar was done. Um, so you can see a couple of examples here for this electric slide guitar. Uh, but the big story here is the invention of the Spanish style electric guitar. And so that's where the Gibson ES-150 should really be best known as really the first commercially successful large scale, um, looks much more like a modern electric guitar that we envision. Um, the Gibson ES-150 ES stands for electric Spanish or electro Spanish. So when you see that on guitar, that's what it's saying. So EH is for electric Hawaiian. Um, and 150, in this case, is actually how much it cost. Um, so $150 back in 1937. Um, here is a new kind of pickup, right? So this pickup, as you can see here, is no longer this horseshoe around the strings. It is beneath the strings and is built into the guitar. And in this case, this guitar has F holes, like a, a violin, not the central sound hole that you might be accustomed to. Um, both styles you'll see on electric guitars. Um, but this guitar was really made famous by um, a gentleman who most everyone uh, really should know if you don't already, um, and that is Charlie Christian. Um, the pickup is actually nicknamed uh, the Christian uh, pickup um, because he was really the first person to take the guitar from being that rhythm instrument to being front and center of the band. Um, he was really the electric guitar's first virtuoso player. He performed like playing on a horn. Um, he especially gained prominence in 1939 when he joined the racially integrated Benny Goodman sextet. Um, this is a big deal in 1939 to have an integrated band, as you can imagine. Um, and he just blew people away with his uh, virtuoso styling. And it's a great quote from him. He said, guitar players have long needed a champion, someone to explain to the world that a guitarist is something more than a robot, plucking on a gadget to keep the rhythm going. Hmm. Um, so his role in, in popularizing the electric guitar and his particular association with this ES-150 is why, as I said, the uh, pickup gets his name. So if you hear Charlie Christian pickup, this is what we're talking about. It's amazing how good of a musician he was, too. I mean, yeah. he's still, I mean, you know, I, I am a big uh, jazz fan, so uh, I know his his music really well, and uh, I mean, he's still, like, what, you know, revered as one of the best, and uh, mm -hmm. that's amazing. And rightly so. We did, ha we did have a comment about uh, oh, sure. mm -hmm. the uh, the 150, Somebody mm -hmm. said, that's a lot of money in 1937. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it did come with an amp, because you had to have an amp to plug okay. in. I should have mentioned that. But nonetheless, $150, yes, in 1937 was a lot of money. Uh, so as you can a imagine, lot more than that now to get yeah, a well, 1937 God, yeah. Gibson. Yeah, we do have a Gibson ES-150 in our collection. Nice. Um, but yeah, they're hard to, they're hard to find. Um, but here he is playing more close up. And you can see him here with the Benny Goodman sextet they're sort of uh, center to the right of the microphone. Remember my discussion about the microphones? Well, that's what that sort of box, uh, uh, well, actually that's his amp, I think. But um, they would be, um, the microphones would have been hanging up here. But uh, he's, this is him sitting there playing. Unfortunately, he died young, as a lot of many, many famous musicians did. Um, so I just, uh, you know, for those of you who are actually really interested in the evolution of this, um, I thought I would throw them all together. So. As I go into what becomes known as the rock and roll electric guitar, the solid body Spanish electric, I thought I would show you the three different styles we're really talking about here so you can get a sense of the evolution. So as I said, first you have this acoustic one that looks very much like the non-electric, uh, you know, all the early versions of um, guitars, even from other um, cultures. Um, this one, the headstock is actually curved, which most American ones were more of the square type. Um, this has this round sound hole, the um, body uh, that's uh, the sort of curved shape um, around the edges um, with the bridge and the hollow body. And then you get to this to Charlie Christian, right? So we've talked about where the that is. There's a tail pace piece, there's tone and volume controls, the sound holes and so on. And then we get to what we know best, probably the solid body electric. And I'll just note here that it's it can be an asymmetrical shape because once you remove the hollow body, the shape doesn't affect the sound that much. Um, so you can get more uh, creative with uh, styles and design. Could you tell us about this little piece to the right of the pickup? Which one? Which On pickup? the uh, middle, uh, the, one of the earlier. So the, this? The, yeah. 
Oh, this is just, uh, it's for the hands. Uh, it's sort of, uh, what's the, uh, someone else in the audience, I'm sure knows the word. I'm, I'm totally blanking out at the moment. Um, but it doesn't have a function particularly other than okay. from the hands. Um, and so I'll get a little more into this next uh, set. Kristen, Kristen Mar Romero says uh, it's a pit, pit guard. Pit guard, thank you. I, I, I could not think of the word, Kristen, thank you. <laughs> I knew, I knew if you were on this call, you would know it. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Um, so let's talk about that solid body electric. This is actually, in some people's minds, um, in, for all intents and purposes, this was a solid body electric guitar, but it wasn't designed for that. Um, it was designed out of Bakelite. Bakelite was a very popular new plastic uh, in the 1930s, um, but it was also very heavy. And so this guitar... Uh, had hollow parts, but that was really only for the weight. Um, it was not because it was designed as a solid body, but some people have said, you know, this is really the precursor of all that. And again, you see that um, horseshoe pickup is back on this particular style. Um, and then uh, most famously and somewhat erroneously, uh, Les Paul is often given credit for the solid body electric guitar. And here he is, uh, I got to meet him. He was here at the Smithsonian uh, back in 1996, and he had not been reunited with his log guitar since he had donated it to uh, into Nashville. So he was very excited to get to hold it again. No, and um, what's notable about this is that he basically took a piece of wood, put some strings and pickups on it, and went out and played it. And the club owner said, that thing doesn't look like a guitar. You can't play that, uh, even though it works perfectly fine. So he cut another guitar in half, Flaps the sides on, and then it looked like a guitar, and he could play it that way. Even though this right. stuff made absolutely no difference. Um, <laughs> so he was definitely an important innovator in the guitar. In that, um, a he was a very prominent guitar player at the time, uh, and his association with a guitar company like Gibson uh, certainly made a difference. Um, and he certainly was inventive. Um, I would argue that he deserves less credit for his work on electric guitar and much more credit than he gets for um, musical recording. Yeah. Uh, the work he did on sound on sound and multi-tracking and all this other stuff is, is incredible and revolutionized the recording industry. And I think it's a shame in many ways that he's not as well known for that because that's where he really had the biggest impact. Nonetheless, here he has his 1941 log guitar and many people point to this as sort of the first um, solid body electric. However, you got to totally agree from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> However, in our collections at the Smithsonian, we have this Slingerland Spanish style electric guitar, and we have the trade literature to show that it was on sale between 1936 and 1939. Wow. So it predates uh, Les Paul. Hmm. Um, it again has a horseshoe pickup type um, and the pick guard. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see, but you can see the little electric. Uh, chords. Um, one of my colleagues actually played it. Uh, they put new strings on, plugged it in, and it still worked. Oh, um, and it hadn't been played probably since it was given to the museum sometime, I don't know, in the 60s maybe. Wow. Um, so we know that this is really uh, was a solid body electric. It looks like an electric Hawaiian guitar, but it was actually an electric Spanish guitar. Um, so I just like to point that out. And it also uh, this guitar with case and amplifier sold for $150. That seems to be the magic hmm. amount. All right. So uh, moving on, okay, I'm getting a little long here, so I'll try to move things along. That's um, good. Other people who are involved, uh, you may have heard of, uh, Merle Travis and Paul Bigsby got together. And I think this is an important point to make, that it's often these makers and players working together to develop instruments. Um, this is true for all invention, not just music, but I think music uh, is easiest to point out. Um, it usually takes someone who's doing whatever in that field who says, I want to do this, yeah. something different, something new, and they go to somebody who can make it and say, can you try to make this? And then the maker makes it, and then they try it out, and then they tell them what they like, and then they tweak, and they go back and forth, and they come up with something that they both like, right? So that's what happens with this. Merle Travis and Paul Bigsby, uh, they design this, uh, Bigsby designs this tailpiece. Uh, that becomes very important um, because you can now uh, uh, basically um, change the string tension uh -huh. um, and, and do some interesting things with the sound. Um, so here he is with his guitar in the 1947. And I bring this up in two because there's sometimes some controversy brought up between him and this gentleman, Leo Fender. 
Uh, the inventor of his first um, Spanish electric was shown here, the broadcaster. Um, it was renamed the telecaster because of a um, copyright dispute over the name broadcaster. And um, Leo Fender really should be known as the father of the Spanish electric guitar in terms of the commercial market. Um, he is really the one who figures out how to make this into a mass manufactured um, instrument um, for the masses and has been nicknamed the Henry Ford of the electric guitar because of that. Um, he figured out how to basically take um, the solid body um, and add um, a bolt on neck um, mm -hmm. so that for manufacturing that was a lot easier in two parts and then he bolted together. Um, so if you look, I'm not sure if I have a picture of it on the back, you'll see a bolt plate. Um, but um, this really took off. Now there's a lot of controversy about how much he may have been influenced by the Paul Bigsby guitar before his. Um, they did know each other as also an invention. All these people tend to know each other. They're all working in similar fields. They have similar interests, they share ideas. Um, and you can see there are some similarities. Uh, but again, it's not like guitars have come that far at this point to be that different. Um, so, you know, there, this is definitely different, his layout of the pickup. Um, they both have this sort of angled um, headstock. Uh, Bigsby has his tailpiece that he does not. Um, but anyway, there, there has been some things said about that. But I still think um, that Leo Fender um, really deserves credit, as I said, um, for making the instrument uh, what it became. Um, I but also like, sorry. Was Fender in California? Yes. Yeah, and most of these people were. Uh, in fact, uh, Les, they also knew Les Paul. He was out in LA too. Okay. Um, and this is also an interesting story about um, places of invention. Actually, yeah. to harken back to Peoria, um, there were a lot of people in LA working in music. In the music industry, as it started now this broadcasting, as I said, the recording industry was often based. A lot of it was in LA. Um, a lot of these people were there. Leo Fender was actually a radio repairman. Mm -hmm. um, he, he did not play. Um, he just loved country and Western music. And he was fiddling with guitars. He'd actually made uh, some electro Hawaiian guitars in the 1940s. So he did know how to make these guitars before big, you know, meeting Bigsby and all that. Uh -huh. um, but these instruments, these electric uh, Spanish instruments started coming across his bench and they wanted them to be fixed. And so he started fixing them. And then he said, I can do better than this. And so that's why he invented most, broadcaster. most of the luthiers I, I know do not play the instruments that they yeah. fix. <laughs> well, I must say, as being for being an expert on the electric guitar, I do not play either, which is a real crime, and someday I will learn. But <laughs> I, I have dabbled, but I would not say I play. So anyway, do, uh, but also, do you, play I think, another, do you play another instrument? Uh, I have played the violin and the piano, oh. okay. um, but not for a long time. Uh, but I do something about stringed instruments, at least. But I also want to say that part of the reason I give Leo Fender all credit is that he also invented the P bass or precision bass shown here. And although this is a little off from the guitar, because obviously the bass is different, um, it shows his inventive skill and range. Um, this came out the year after the Fender broadcaster. Um, and although, again, there had been some earlier electric stand-up basses, um, including this guy Paul Tutmark in Seattle had one. Uh, this was the first commercially successful electric bass guitar that was played like a standard guitar. And uh, Monk, Monk Montgomery, shown here on the right, helped popularize this instrument. Um, and any band you see, pretty much, you'll see one of these bass guitars, even now, um, mm -hmm. being played. Um, and so P bass has now become sort of the generic term, kind of like Kleenex, uh, for any big bass. But there is actually a particular brand, uh, so the Fender Precision Bass. So this is where we start to get into the, the, the big rivalry between Gibson and Fender. So let's talk about Gibson here for a moment. These are uh, Gibson's answer to Fender. Um, Gibson had been the leader in guitar making um, and they developed this instrument um, in direct response to the success of what was now called the Telecaster. This instrument, um, despite uh, the fact that a lot of people um, associate this with Les Paul. It was actually primarily designed by Gibson's president, Ted McCurdy, whose name will come up again later. Um, although guitarist Les Paul's input may have in included the original trapeze style combination bridge tailpiece that you can see over here. Mm -hmm. um, 
But here again is Ted McCarty's um, patent. And um, the gold finish, this is an interesting story. The gold finish is called the gold top. It was nicknamed the gold top. And it was used in part because they wanted to disguise from their competitors what wood they were using. Um, Gibson was going up market. They didn't, they, uh, McCarty called the big Fender broadcaster the plank guitar. They were very dismissive of Fender's sort of rough and ready commercial versions. And so they, uh -huh. you know, here is this fab, you know, this well-known uh, company with their associates Les Paul, and they wanted to go higher end. So they developed this um, with a maple cap on a solid mahogany body, um, which even though, as I said before, the wood and the shape doesn't make as much difference, there is still a little bit of difference in the kind of wood you use, mm -hmm. the sound you get, even for a solid body. Uh, so they were using more expensive wood than Fender. Um, so they painted it gold so that Fender wouldn't know what the woods were. Uh, <laughs> so, and um, they said that using these two kinds of wood were, would have the bright attack of maple with the warmth and richness of mahogany. So that was how they described That's the nice. sound. Um, and after its introduction in uh, 1952, it went through various uh, modifications, but the most famous one is probably this 1958 sunburst finish. Uh, this is the one that everybody wants. Um, it's very hard to get. <laughs> um, as you can see, we were actually had to uh, get loans for this. Um, this was the classic standard with its sun, what they call the sunburst finish and newly perfected double coil or a humbucking pickup. So that is what these thicker looking pickups are. These are the humbucking double coil pickups. And this is a big advance for the sound of the electric guitar. Um, and so uh, this- A very this different a, tone between single coil pickups and, and those humbuckers. Yeah, musicians really like the sort of warmer tone that you could get from this. And um, so because of the success of that, then Fender had to do them one better. So he invented the Fender Telecaster, which is probably the most famous. If, if you found someone off the street that's never, you know, doesn't know anything about guitars, they probably heard of a Fender Telecaster. Yeah. Um, oh, Stratocaster, sorry, I said Telecaster, didn't I? Stratocaster. Um, this is uh, the first one with three pickups. This one has single pickups, though, not the double humbucking ones on the Les Paul. Again, here's his uh, patent for this. So when this comes out, this was probably the most, I would argue, the most influential guitar ever made. Um, it's very identifiable from the sort of double cutaway so that uh, it's cut lower down here so you can get closer, uh, farther down the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. um, the three pickups gave you even more options. You could uh, combine or play just one. Um, he has his own um, uh, patented tremolo system. So Fender also patented, patented this tremolo system, which allowed players to raise and lower the pitch of the strings. And this really brought a whole new sound. Very so similar with, to the Bigsby concept. Yeah, but much more, um, <clears throat> has a really now a really new sound. We've really yeah. now stepped away from the earlier electrics. And this is why rock and roll uh, comes to be really in many ways. It's the culmination of musical genres that had been popular in the United States, um, like blues and, and country and jazz, um, combined with these, this new sound of this instrument. Um, and in the hands of people like Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly, you know, this is the new symbol now, right? It's that everyone wants to be cool like them with the electric guitar in hand. Um, and uh, this uh, Berry's Maybelline guitar is actually in the collections of our um, sister museum at the African American History and Culture Museum. Um, and so this is really where most people get to know the electric guitar and it becomes associated particularly with rock and roll music. Um, Ironically, Fender hated rock and roll. Uh, he really liked his country and Western, and he was not so thrilled that his instrument became so associated with, uh, with rock and roll, which I just think is a great story. That uh, is great. I'd never but, heard of it. Yeah, yeah. So he's quite a character. Um, I could go on, but that, that <laughs> I thought was a, there's a little cocktail tidbit for you if any of you are talking guitars with people. Um, there were a couple other companies. Fender and Gibson are really the early ones that really push forward this instrument. Um, as this new sound, it becomes, you know, the thing to play. Uh, but there are other companies. Rickenbacker comes back. They're still around. Uh, the 12 string shown here is what uh, Harrison was playing. Um, Gretsch is another one that there's a lot of great Gretsch uh, electrics, both uh, semi hollow body and solid body. Um, so there are other companies. And of course, there's smaller boutique makers still, um, you know, and then 
the nice thing about these guitars is a lot of people would uh, innovate in their own ways and take parts of guitars sometimes and put them together in new ways. Um, so uh, it becomes, as you can see here, the size, talk about the size of crowds changing. You know, now with rock and roll with, you know, you can play the stadiums because you have these loud instruments, you've got the amps. And of course, with this comes new styles of playing. Um, you know, I, I, one thing I really didn't say is one of the reasons for the invention of the solid body electric was that um, people wanted a cleaner sound. The problem with the hollow body electrics is that you've got a lot of feedback and overtones mm -hmm. from the hollow body of the guitar and people wanted a cleaner sound, especially as they were now recording, right? So the solid body means you're not getting that feedback from the body of the guitar. You're just purely hearing the pickups through the amp. Well, so they had this nice clean cutting sound and that's the 1950s rock and roll sound I think we're all familiar with, right? But then you go to the 1960s and people want to bring back all that dirty sound that <laughs> they first got rid of, right? And one of the most famous people, and rightly so, is Jimi Hendrix for this. Um, you know, he figured out all sorts of new ways to play it, from his teeth to grinding it on the uh, uh, speakers to uh, a microphone to all sorts of other things. But it's definitely sort of ironic that after having invented this instrument get, to get rid of that sound, they've essentially brought it back in other ways. Um, and he also and, learned to play it upside down. Yes, yes, and yeah, and that's great. And he's, yeah, you can see him Which is it's switched. Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. As a player myself, I, it doesn't, uh, I can't comprehend it. Yeah, it, it's, ama it's amazing. Um, and I'll just read this quote from you because I just think it's, it's great. So sometimes I jump on the guitar, sometimes I grind the strings against the frets. The more it grinds, the more it whines. Sometimes I rub up against the amplifier. Sometimes I play the guitar with my teeth or with my elbow. I can't remember all the things I do. Um, <laughs> and he's another one who died too young and you know, you just wonder like what else he would have done for the music world. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, you're getting uh, more signature guitars and different shapes. Here's Ted McCarty again. He's the Gibson uh, vice president I mentioned who really designed the Gibson Les Paul model. Um, this is his Flying V. Some of you, if you're into guitars, will know this instrument. Uh, it, it was developed, first didn't take off, but then the 70s, uh, people started coming back to it. They liked this sort of futuristic look to it. Um, and then Paul Reed Smith guitars, if you've heard of them, uh, they are a very big uh, guitar company now in the U.S. out of Stevensville, Maryland, near me, where I live. And Paul Reed Smith uh, had Ted McCarty as his mentor. And in his honor, he designed the PRS McCarty guitar. And that's what's oh, that's here. great. I never Tiger Strike Wood. I play a... Uh... Paul Reed Smith guitar, and I never knew that. Yeah, and Paul Reed Smith's great. I got to go to his factory as well. Um, and I actually got to meet Ted McCarty shortly before he died. He was at our programs in 1996. Um, had a major influence on the development of electric guitar and is one of those like unsung heroes uh, in the background that you've just never heard of because his name's not on guitars, uh, except for this one. That, uh, so the, the first line V came out was, came out in 58? Uh, it was in the, uh, with, with, uh, yes, 58. It was we, part of a modernistic sort of line of guitars they tried. There was also a, the Explorer, which was asymmetrical. Uh -huh. uh, but at the time, uh, they were a little too extreme. But again, it was the late 60s. People like um, Jimi Hendrix, in fact, and uh, Albert King, his mother, brought it back to yeah. popularity. Um, so, you know, they're getting, they're getting flashier. They're getting, uh, and, and talk about flashy. We got to talk about Eddie Van Halen, um, who just passed away. Uh, Again, I got to meet him, lovely man, uh, and so creative and talented. And much like Jimi Hendrix, he taught himself to play. Uh, uh, so he learned some, he, he taught him, he plays some unusual styles that he's gotten a lot of credit for. And as he said, he's like, I just didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> so he has this like tapping way of playing, if you know anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he also was inventive and he took uh, parts of guitars that he thought were the best and put them together into what he called his Frankenstein guitar. And they just dressed it up with some tape and paint and other stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, he's another one who, like uh, Hendrix, had a huge impact on how people heard the sound, learned to play. Uh, you know, they're, they're the rock and roll gods. Um, I love this idea of these incredible innovations that were made by uh, extremely creative artists that wanted to take their music to a to a place that they were having a problem taking it to, and they needed to invent a new guitar to make that happen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think we, we really underestimate uh, musicians in general as thinking they just sort of take an instrument that's given to them and they go. Um, a lot of them, if they have obviously the money and the, the impact, are able to say, look, I, I have this very specific sound I want, or I have a very specific way of playing that needs to be adapted. Um, there's all sorts of things about these guitar designs now as they're getting more creative because they can with these solid body um, builds that fit their personalities, that fit their style of playing. Even things like, you can't see this, but for a lot of these guitars, they have um, basically like a, a little indentation. So they fit nicely on your stomach. So they feel more comfortable that way. They're not just flat. Um, there's all sorts of different ways. Prince obviously is very famous, and again, rightly so, for his impact on the guitars. Wow. Um, we have this one in our collection, the Yellow Cloud. I also got to handle that. Um, and uh, it's got his... Um, symbol on the fingerboard. You can't really see it all. It's also on the side. I like to point out with him, many people think he was just trying to be difficult and, and being you know, an artiste by switching to the symbol um, for a time. He actually did it to get out of a contract. He had a recording contract he didn't like. The lawyers were fighting about it. They wouldn't let him out of the contract and said, fine, I'm not Prince anymore. <laughs> that's he great. came up with the symbol and that's why he did it. He was a very actually smart businessman in that respect. Unfortunately, he didn't leave a will for his family, which is less all sorts of other issues, but he um, was amazing. So, yeah. you know, this obviously, you know, it, be, it became in, in the 70s, 80s, you know, 90s grunge, you know, it became the big thing uh, for boys and, and even girls uh, started playing more, um, you know, it became the sort of rebellious symbol still, uh, the thing your parents hated hearing you, you know, screeching away in the you yeah. know, basement or garage. But, um, you know, unfortunately still very few women players, but there have been a few who've been particularly important, and I, I wanted to make sure to mention them. Um, Bonnie Raitt is one. If you haven't had a chance to ever hear of her in concert, uh, when we get to go to concerts again, I highly recommend her. Uh, I've gotten to hear her play, and she's just amazing. She can play all sorts of different kinds of music. Um, and, um, and then Joan Jett, who really brought a new sort of edgy um, side to, yeah. to uh, the guitar playing, especially for women. Um, and they are two of the only women on the top 100 guitar list from Rolling Stone, hmm. um, unfortunately. Uh, still, I think. I haven't, I haven't seen the latest list, but um, the two of them and Joni Mitchell were the only women yeah. on the top 100 guitar list last I checked. So um, our collection continues to grow uh, slowly because we don't currently actually have a guitar curator. Um, ironically, uh, this is not my, my day job, really. Um, wow. But uh, we have a Sting, one of Sting's Fender Stratocasters. We have a Parker Flies, the cool, uh, which had some new um, types of pickup designs. Um, Steve Cropper, if you know the song Green Onions, uh, yeah. he, yes, he's the bass player. Um, Bucky Pizzarelli, famous um, jazz player. And then another, um, Paul Reed Smith, the Dragon. This is this very cool inlaid. I, it's, I don't know, it's like $20,000 or something to buy that guitar, but uh, it's beautiful. So those are some of the things. And, you know, I, there are so many ways that I'm sure we can all picture how the American uh, culture is seen as being sort of part and parcel with this electric guitar that, you know, the electric guitar has become the sort of symbol for American music. Um, I just use examples from Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I just think it's amazing uh, from Dubai to Myanmar, Burma, you know, that even in places that you think wouldn't necessarily uh, have these kinds of things, um, so electric guitar is everywhere and it's become so ubiquitous it's, it's hard to imagine music without it even though in some respects it's, it's not as uh, central as it used to be um, because of the ways the recording are done and other things um, but there's still obviously a lot of great uh, musicians uh, and guitarists I have to do a shout out to Dave Grohl among others who I know is uh, one of my friends who's on this call and <laughs> loves um, and I just had to finish with this ad. I just think this is great. Fender had a series of these wonderful ads um, that uh, you won't part with yours either. Here he is off going into the ocean. Um, if you want something fun, uh, I leave you this uh, link here, uh, music.si.edu slash video slash history hyphen electric hyphen guitar. Um, this wonderful guy, G.E. Smith, if you are old fans of Saturday Night Live, he used to be the band leader for Saturday yeah. Night Live. He is an amazing guitar player, an amazing collector, and he knows a lot about history of guitar. Uh, he hung out with us uh, in 1996. We were doing our exhibit. He actually played for us in our conference room. He can play any kind of music. And he very kindly did the history of electric guitar in five minutes as played by him on different instruments. Oh, 
Oh, wow. If you get a chance, I, I, I invite you to, to watch that. So that's a lot. I'm sorry, I've kind of babbled on here, but um, I hope it gives you a sense of the evolution. Frankly, the instrument hasn't changed that much uh, yeah. since these times. Um, there, mostly the changes in invention and innovations have been in things like um, the, some of the ways they can enhance the sound. So things like um, wah-wah pedals and other sound effects yeah, that yeah. have been changed. Um, but the instrument itself really hasn't changed that much since um, the, the 50s and this um, solid body electric really um, just, it, it's hard to think back now to the music without it. Um, and I think that uh, it's a lot earlier than most people realize. So I think, you know, just, just knowing that it actually comes out of the 30s, I think is, is if, not, if you take out nothing else with you tonight, uh, I hope knowing that this instrument's actually been around now for almost a hundred years um, is pretty amazing. It is. And, amazing. Uh, yeah. So thank you. You're uh, welcome. I look forward to questions. If there's yeah, questions. I've got one for you right now. They Great. just sort of led right into you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you sort of already touched on this, but um, she asks, uh, what's the future of the guitar? Which I think you sort of talked about technology and pedals. Um, I think, uh, well, let me ask the other part of her uh, question here, and then we can we can talk about it. But uh, do you think there's another uh, newly invented instrument could ever have the same impact on our culture as the guitar and the electric guitar has had? Uh, it's always dangerous to uh, prognosticate, but uh, I think what we've seen with the electric guitar, and I think is the truth, is, is it's all now about apps and software and hardware and um, the recording aspects of it more yeah. than the instruments themselves. Um, another example is um, that really revolutionized music uh, for good or ill is auto-tune. Um, and I've actually met the inventor of auto-tune as well. We had him for a program um, which uh, basically can make any singer sound good. Um, yeah. And so that, you, you- That's up for debate. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, better maybe. So yeah. Any singer sounds better perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> But nonetheless, um, I think like a lot of things, it's, it's really about the electronics now and the software, you know, and, and the recording um, machinery and, and um, software more than anything. You know, I, I don't know. I hope I'm proved wrong. I would love to see kind of a more uh, throwback to seeing some older instruments um, maybe uh, innovated on. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of... Uh... Um, artists that sort of fall into becoming luthiers and without that traditional background of guitar making have really taken uh, uh, guitars to a, a different place that are, it's kind of like unimaginable but these are not instruments that are going to be mass produced and played all over the world these are very specific yeah, I think I think much like the guitar maker you had in December, you know, we've gone to more of a bespoke kind of. Yeah. Um, if you want a particular sound or style or what, whatever, you go and you have that made your sound, which is great, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not. It's sort of a. It's sort of like the general, I think, uh, social move sort of toward sort of wanting to be, you know, different and having, you know, going to. Etsy or going to yeah. a DIY or whatever. So there's this kind of wanting to have your thing that isn't mass produced. It isn't the thing that comes from the factory floor. Um, but whether that will turn around again, I, you know, so it's hard to say. Creating uh, individual yeah. visions of what you can, I mean, at the core, they're all the same thing, but they be, uh, the end result is so different. That's, that's what I hope that programs like this inspire people to continue mm -hmm to uh, push those boundaries, even though, you know, there's uh, um, the possibility you may end up with something similar. It's going to be individual and your own. And um, Well, I think that is a good lesson about invention. It doesn't have to be this game changing, you know, change the world thing. Most invention isn't. It's incremental. It's, it, you see a problem and you try to take what you know and, and do something a little bit different with it to solve that problem. Um, it's even things like, you know, I think Eddie Van Halen's great, you know, just that he was like, well, I like, you know, the headstock on this and I like the body on that and this pickup and that thing or whatever. And, you know, he put them together and 
um, that's actually not that out of reach for other people to do, right? You don't have to be an Eddie Van Halen to do that. No, um, you don't. And I, I know just a, just yeah. here in Central Illinois, there are, there are multiple players that come to mind that have altered their guitars, and we've had several in our uh, Golden Voice uh, studio that's part of the exhibition right now that alter guitars to fit their uh, their style or how they've uh, evolved into a guitar player. Uh, they built new, basically new guitars that are their inventions, but at mm -hmm. the core, still a guitar. Yeah. And it's also in your style of playing. I mean, people like, you know, Eddie Van Halen uh, uh, or Hendrix or other, you know, who for whatever reason came up with their own way of playing and, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. Um, but I think it's actually a really important message for invention. I think we do a disservice um, because for the Lovelson Center at Smithsonian, our big message is that everyone is inventive. It doesn't mean every one of us is going to become an inventor per se. Mm -hmm. All humans have inventive capabilities and you can support and nurture and foster those. Um, and part of it is just not saying to yourself, no, I can't do that. Or not saying, well, someone else has, so why should I do it? You know, it's saying, look, we all face little day-to-day -day problems that we innovate on and we don't even realize that's what we're doing. For sure. Um, and we, you know, part of our big message is, you know, you don't have to have invented the electric guitar that, you know, made rock and roll happen or which, you know, obviously there wasn't just one, right? It's, it's an evolution. Yeah. Um, but a lot of invention is because of your own personal need or a community need um, or a sound you want or, um, and, and we want to encourage that. We, want, we don't want people to feel like, well, I'm not a Leo Fender, so, you know, my tinkering around uh, isn't yeah. valid. Um, I, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, people tinkering around with things during this time. So hopefully yeah. some, some great things come out of this unfortunate situation. Yeah. Yeah, I've often, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say this because it's sort of political, but I, I do joke about when I think about all the Russian hacking uh, discussions, and I think, God, if you took all of that creative energy, all of that knowledge about technology and put it to good use, you know, we could probably clean the waters of the world. We could, you know, like, just think of all the wonderful things we could do for humanity. And I guess, you know, as much as I'm joking about it, I think, you know, humans have so much potential um, and we have so, and we now have so many resources we didn't have even a hundred years ago. Um, that you know, you you have options. You can either take all this cool stuff and all these skills and all this knowledge and do something helpful, even if it's only just problem solving. Again, as I said, in your own house or community, it doesn't have to be to change the world. Yeah. Um, but there's there's a lot you know we all have inside us that we can tap into more if we were told that it was okay, you know. It's okay yeah. to mess around with stuff. It's okay to try that. It's okay to try and fail and try, you know, try again. Because that's none of these instruments I showed you were just done once and ta-da, they were finished, right? These these all represent um, years of work and dedication and tinkering and multiple people and you know even though Fender's name is on it or Gibson or whatever, you know, it's it's not just one individual. They they may have to have their name on the patent even, but it takes a village usually to put these things together. And I think that's also an important point to make. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Monica. Um, one thing I want to say to everyone that's still on the call here before uh, we say goodbye is that um, um, we invite you to join us for a final walkthrough of the, uh, of the exhibition live on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Uh, after we get off the call here. So anybody who wants to see the uh, exhibition, it, it is coming down uh, next week. Mm. So um, everyone who's on the call, thank you for, uh, for participating. And Monica, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, it was a great program and uh, you really, uh, you really <laughs> added, it was, it was a great end because you really added to everything that's sort of uh, been building up for the last uh, three months. And uh, we've really put a lot of information out there about the guitar. So it, it was really, really great to have you. And well, to have the you. Smithsonian involved, uh, we are very grateful to be an affiliate. And uh, please uh, know that we are uh, very grateful to have you. Well, thank you all very much. And um, 
my email is on here. So if you, anyone who's on the call has questions or wants to follow up, feel free to email me and I'm happy to chat. That sounds great. Thank you, Monica. Right, thanks again, Zach. Take care, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs>